Did you press the button? Sorry. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Ashraf, and we're here to talk what the front end? <laughs> Twig, render arrays, and caching in Drupal. So my name is Ashraf. It's actually pronounced more like the A's are U's, Ashraf. Um, I got all the certifications from Acquia, which is where the Grandmaster tag comes from. Um, but I run Debug Academy out of the Washington, D.C. area. Um, we do Drupal training, as the name implies. We also do training for React and decoupled Drupal. Um, if you're looking for team training, give me a call. Come take my card afterwards if you'd like. And um, you know we do live training primarily, so live online, live in person, uh, with thorough written, written uh, documentation to match. If anyone is looking to become a Drupal developer or receive more formal training on that, um, our three-month part-time course starts this Sunday. Um, so, considering that so soon, come talk to me and we'll see if it makes sense for you. Uh, but that's two three-hour classes per week, beginning this Sunday, running through until the start of May. Um, in that, we go through PHP, Composer, object-oriented programming, Git. Everything you're seeing today in today's presentation was actually just copy-pasted from our three-month course. So this was the easiest. Um, session preparation I've ever needed to do, um, but this will give you a bit of a feel for um, what our presentations are like. Granted, in that course, we have hands-on exercises. Today, we're just going to be learning some hopefully new material for the group. Um, so we're going to start out talking about Twig. I might move a little quickly because Twig, render arrays, and caching all put together is um, it consists of some somewhat complicated topics and quite a bit of material. Um, so Twig, starting with Twig, if anyone is from a Drupal 7 background, we would create our markup files as uh, what were called tpl.php files. And notice those ended in PHP. So in Drupal 7, we actually were writing our markup in PHP files. And what that meant is you could potentially write regular HTML, but anytime you wanted to print a variable, you would have to put an opening PHP tag and a closing PHP tag and get all of the PHP syntax right. Miss a semicolon, your site goes down. Um, Twig comes to sort of be a happy, happy middle ground between HTML and PHP. Um, it gives you some of the power of PHP uh, without the syntax overhead. It, it's a little more clear. And I think that, that's really what it was created for. It's not created by Drupal for Drupal. It's actually available and used um, in Symfony for Laravel, et cetera. Other PHP-based projects um, also use Twig. Let's take a look at Twig, Twig syntax. And all of these are valid Twig syntax. HTML and JavaScript, as is, you can just write them. Um, and then there are different categories of Twig code, and we'll take a look at each one of them. So HTML, CSS, I think we'll show that right after this slide, but um, if we're looking to print variables in Twig, you just use these curly braces. Two curly braces on either side of the variable, the variable name in between, and that's it. That, in PHP, would be equivalent to opening PHP tag, the word print, dollar sign, the variable, semicolon, closing PHP tag. So it's much easier to understand this, and it's uh, much less likely to maybe make a mistake when you're writing it. Um, but much like Drupal 7, uh, actually, let me get a feel for the room. How many people here have worked in Drupal 7 theming? OK, more than half. Um, OK, so, so I will still draw those parallels. Um, but uh, basically, it's much easier to write this syntax. It's much less error prone. And if you're not coming from a Drupal or even PHP background and you just want to do front end development, you don't have to learn PHP. Um, most of the variables available in your Twig files do come from PHP. They're passed in from PHP files. 
and if you're lucky, you'll see comments at the top of your twig file that lists all of the available variables. We'll talk about what to do when you're not so lucky. Um, you can write regular HTML and JavaScript in your twig file directly. The nice thing about it not being a PHP file is you don't need to escape any characters. Just write raw HTML, raw JavaScript. Um, use single quotes, double quotes. Don't worry about it. It'll work. So what you see on the right, that's a valid twig file. And you can see the URL and the label. Um, I have my nice little laser pointer. Um, those are twig variables that are being printed. So you get to use it in line without overhauling everything you're doing. Just like in PHP, where you can do a multi-line comment by writing slash asterisk, asterisk slash, in Twig, you can do curly brace, pound sign, pound sign curly brace. Those are your wrappers for your comments. You can use that for multi-line comments, single line comments, and so on. So whatever you put in between those will not appear on the site. It won't get rendered. Again, I'm moving relatively quickly because there's a lot to cover, but hopefully this will be beneficial. Um, there's printing, commenting, and then there's doing. If you want to do something more advanced in Twig, it typically is surrounded by a curly brace and then percentage sign. So something like a function call listed here, you see the curly brace, percentage sign, the name of your function, and then again, percentage, um, curly brace. Oops. I was trying to get rid of the little icon in the bottom left, or the little menu. Okay. Um, just like PHP, you have the ability to write conditionals, but the syntax is meant to be a little more human friendly. Um, so you could write if is home page, just like in PHP, if a variable is empty, you can write if variable name. So if is home page, welcome to the home page, and if. Um, by doing that, if the variable, which we assume to be pre existing, is home page, if that's set to true or one, this will render. If it's not, if it's set to zero or false, it will not render. You can also use comparison. If equals, if role equals anonymous, please sign in. Um, and you could, you could really do quite a bit. You could write if, if variable is not equal some other variable, um, and you just write out the words is not. Um, so there's, there are lots of options when writing your conditionals and they're really written to be easy for maybe people without a um, PHP background to understand. You can even do loops. Again, with the syntax slides, I'm moving relatively quickly through them. Um, you can even do loops and they can be written as shown here for a node in all nodes. So in this example, all nodes would be an array and just like a for each loop in PHP, um, you can loop through every single item in that array, print it, whatever you like, um, and you store each item one at a time in the node variable. Twig does have support for functions. Um, there are many functions available. It's, it's somewhat rare that you would actually create your own Twig function, but uh, Drupal core provides a bunch of Twig functions um, such as the attached library one. So if you wanted to associate the bootstrap CSS with your Twig code, you could actually just drop attached library directly into your Twig file and it will always load that JavaScript and CSS along with your Twig file whenever that file is rendered. So you don't have to necessarily write a preprocess hook and attach the library. Okay. Some of the other functions provided by Drupal listed here. We've got create attribute for things like adding classes um, to divs. You have file URL to convert a URI to a URL. Um, link uh, function. And on the right you see a 
a handful of additional twig functions available. One nifty feature of twig is a filter. So you can use the pipe symbol right here. If you are comfortable using the command line, uh, you might be used to printing out variables and then using a pipe symbol and grepping through the output of that variable and basically repeatedly searching on the output of the previous action. This is exactly the same. So here we've got the first name variable. This is an existing variable which we're printing out, but we put this pipe here and we call the capitalized filter. So what that would do is it would take the word and capitalize it. So now you output a capitalized version of the variable. And you can put one of these after another. So you can capitalize it and then trim. So here we've got last name with a space. Um, the trim gets rid of the space and the capitalize makes it uppercase, makes the first letter uppercase. Lots of these available as well. Um, like many things in programming, these are things you would look up at the time you want to use it. When you're trying to write Twig for a larger code base, um, in a lot of cases you might want to write sort of like a base styling and then extend it and write variations of it. Um, that might have been difficult with TPL, PHP files, and Drupal 7, um, but with Twig, you actually have a few options for how to do it. I'll go through the first two options pretty quickly because you don't use them as often, and then we'll talk more about the third option. So include, it's sort of like the PHP include. Basically, you write uh, curly brace, parentheses, the word include, the name of the twig file, which you want to essentially uh, be dropped in right here. So you can write code above it, you can write code below it, and you can have another twig file just render right in the middle of there. So if you have like a header file and you want that header file to render in a bunch of other files, you could include it in those files and it will just render um, in each of those files. But the downside to the include is, stay there for one second, you get exactly what was in the file and you can't overwrite some section of it. It's always the entire file that prints out. An alternative is called extends. You can call extends and then the name of a twig file. It behaves similar to include in that it drops the whole contents of the file, but it has two key differences. One, extends expects to uh, essentially be uh, the entire content of the new file. So what I mean by that is um, if I extend this page.html.twig, I'm not allowed to write any HTML above that statement or below it. Only the extend statement can render, and if I write anything else, it's going to throw an error. What I can do, however, is I can overwrite sections, predefined sections, of the file I'm extending. So in page.html.twig, let's say there was a section of code which is surrounded by this block. It's not a Drupal block, it's a twig block. The word block and then any name you come up with. If the file I'm extending has sections, um, has twig blocks, these are called, I do have the ability to overwrite those blocks. So what I can do is I can render my whole page.html.twig and I can specify which blocks from that file I'm overriding. So it renders the whole file and then it swaps out the specific blocks which I decided to override. So I can replace my whole file and swap out specific blocks. Embed is sort of the best of both worlds. With embed, I can drop my embed code in here. I can write HTML above it. I can write HTML below it. That's OK. Um, and I can override specific sections of the file I'm embedding using the same block technique. 
So embed basically gives you the power of include and the power of extend. Um, this one can be very useful if you are trying to make it so you have a base page style or a base block style where you're just rendering and maybe uh, in some instances you need to render a title, in some other instances you don't. Um, so you can you can treat it that way, I guess. Uh, given the flexibility of embed, why does it ever use include or uh, was it uh, Include or uh, extend, yeah. Um, so why would you ever use those when embed is available? A lot of people just use embed 100% of the time. Um, I believe the others might be slightly more efficient in terms of processing time, but um, if you have a good caching strategy, it might not really matter. Um, so, depends on your team, you know, if, and what you're optimizing for and such. Um, but you could default to embed and only fall back if you really find yourself trying to squeeze out every optimization you can. Um, let's see, in Drupal 8, there are a lot of uh, facets of Twig to, um, that you have to understand. Uh, specific to Drupal 8. So how do you override Twig files? Um, how do you handle caching? And if you have a Twig file that doesn't have really thorough comments at the top of the file, how do you know what variables exist inside of that Twig file? So just to show an example of a real site one of the class projects we built. Um, every one of these sections is rendered uh, using Twig code. There was an HTML snippet which renders this donate form from an external um, you know, donate form service, essentially. Um, the CAPTCHA module provided a Twig function for rendering the CAPTCHA, so we just dropped that in. And then we used a custom header to um, dynamically, uh, we use custom twig to dynamically render a custom header depending on the page. So how do you do those overrides? Um, it's essentially all in the name. It's similar again to Drupal 7 in terms of the naming convention of your file determines when the file is used. So you place your .html.twig files inside of your themes templates folder and what Drupal does is it looks for specific Twig files based on um, naming conventions. First, it checks the active themes templates folder. If it finds a Twig file which follows a specific naming convention, it will use that Twig file loaded. Um, if it doesn't find it there, then it looks in the parent themes templates folder for the same files. If it doesn't find it there, it looks in that parent theme. Um, so in the grandparent theme, it goes all the way up the ancestor tree um, until it finds the file, maybe in Drupal core's uh, stable theme. Um, so when you want to override a Twig file, what you typically do is you check what the naming convention is, and then you create a file by that name and put it in the templates folder. Drupal will then discover it and load your file instead. So how do you know what to name it? There are a couple of options. First of all, jump back a second to this link. This link on drupal.org does point you in the right direction in terms of naming conventions. Um, but the way to discover what names can be used is Turn on Twig debug mode, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, it's just a variable you switch in your services.yaml file. And once you do that, all of your pages on the site will output HTML something like this. So you can look at the HTML for something in your site, and it'll tell you these are the file names we're looking for. And it goes from most specific to least specific. Similar to CSS, the more specific selector wins. In Twig, the more specific file name wins. So if there's a node.html.twig file and a node-3.html.twig file, node3 is more specific than node. Um, so when you visit 
the page node three, that is the twig file that would win. Um, node will only get rendered if the rest of the files don't exist. And how do you know what's being rendered? There's an X. So only one file will have an X to it, an X uh, next to it. So what's your starting point when you want to override a twig file? What you would do is you would find the file that's being overridden, all, that's being used already, node.html.twig. It shows you where to find it too. You find that file, you copy it, you paste it into your themes templates folder, and then you choose an appropriate name for it. If you're trying to override that file everywhere on the site, um, for all nodes, you would just use node.html.twig. If you only want to override it for this page, you would use node dash dash three. If you want to override it for this whole content type, node dash dash recipe, or whatever the name of your content type is. But your starting point is to find the current file and copy paste it into your theme. I mentioned to see which files are being rendered, you should use twig debug mode. You do that by going to sites default services.yaml and um, you change the line that says debug false to debug true. It appears right under uh, twig.config. So sites default services.yaml, find twig.config debug false, change it to debug true, save the file, clear the cache, and now that uh, those helpful tips in the HTML will appear everywhere. And you can find out every single line of HTML what twig file it's coming from. So how do you debug variables in Twig? Sometimes there's a list of variables, you know what variables exist, but maybe you don't know how to get a field from them. You could try the dump function. Problem with that is if you dump content, and let's say content is your whole node, um, it might crash your site or be very slow because the node object uh, can be very large. So sometimes what you might do is dump content and then use the filter, remember filters with Twig, filter out the keys. So what that will do is instead of printing out the whole object, it'll only print out the top level keys from your object. So that's a nice way to sort of drill down in your object and figure out what the keys are, maybe figure out what the field names are. And you can go one level at a time. That's sort of like old fashioned print debug statements. Kint is a, a module that's available. I believe it's packaged with the devel module. Um, it's similar to the dump command, but it's a little prettier, and you can drill down um, on the UI, so it'll show your variable, and it'll let you essentially expand it. So the first one was good. This one is better. The best approach, if you're able, is to set up an IDE, so your more advanced uh, code editor, like PHP Storm, VS Code sometimes, um, and so on. Um, set up xdebug on your server and um, create breakpoints. So if you write PHP code, this is something you might already be doing. It's hard to write a lot of Drupal 8 code without setting up your IDE and breakpoints. But if you are doing that and you try to put a breakpoint in a twig file, typically it just won't work. Um, I believe PHP Storm actually supports it natively now, um, but if you're using any other IDE or you're having trouble t getting that working, the devel module comes with a function. The function is devel breakpoint. Just put that in your twig file and that's a breakpoint. It'll just stop rendering right there. The cool thing about that is look at your IDE when the code pauses, so the code pauses at breakpoints. So look at your IDE at that time, and you can see a list of all of the variables that exist in the current scope. So even if there's no comment with variables, you can just find out all of the variables uh, available to you at the, at the time this breakpoint is run. There's also a twig x debug module. If you don't want to use the whole devel module for this, you can use twig x debug and put the breakpoint line, it pretty much does the same thing. It creates a breakpoint 
which allows you to see what variables are available. Uh, twig tweak. Um, this is a contrib module which you can install and it basically gives you a bunch of twig functions. Drupal view, I believe that's for rendering views. Drupal block, renders a block. Um, form, region, image, etc. So these are twig functions. If you want to render a block, you can just call Drupal block, put the block ID and it'll render. You don't need to go to your preprocess and find out how to load the block and do all of that. Um, it also has some filters like token replace. Um, I haven't used Twig Tweak in a while, to be honest. I don't, I don't typically use it, um, but uh, I think when I used it a while ago, it would sometimes introduce caching issues. If you maybe render a block um, in your Twig file, it might not bubble the cache tags from that block, which means if the block changes, uh, your page might not know that it changed. It might stay cached. Um, but it really is a useful module um, for people especially starting out in front-end development so they don't have to get their hands dirty with the Drupal backend. So here's an example with Twig Tweak. Drupal view, the who's online view, and just by adding that line of code, here we go, adding that line of code, now you have the view available uh, rendered right at the bottom of your page. If I stop moving my mouse, the menu in the bottom left will eventually go away. There we go. And you can see it at the bottom of the middle image. OK. So that was a mouthful. That's uh, a lot about Twig. Um, it's, I mentioned many of its advantages. One advantage I, one advantage I don't think I mentioned is that um, it really comes with a lot of security benefits to avoid your team writing raw PHP in your front-end theming files. Um, that's one of the main benefits of using Twig. So one other thing we encounter when we're working with Drupal's front-end um, are the render arrays of doom. Um, so these are things we all see from time to time, um, and I feel like many of us might manipulate them a little bit, but a lot of times we never take the time to really learn how they work or um, how to work with them. So what is a render array? It's an associative array which has all of the data needed for display and it has information on how to render it. So it's not like, um, like it's, it's, uh, it's sort of like the controller in a model view controller um, set up. It's, it's the glue between the back end and the front end. It says, here's the data, here's how I want it to render, and um, it contains all of that information. It also contains information about caching. So how does visiting a page in uh, Drupal work? There's really a lot going on. Someone comes to your site through their browser, something like Google Chrome. Um, they make a request. They say, I want to see the home page. Symphony's kernel um, receives that request, pass, passes the URL to load and the parameters. Um, we go through, the, essentially the render array gets built. Um, this might be the outermost render array. Um, drill down deeper. Um, another render array gets built for the main content. And then the HTML renderer gets called. So basically at this point, all of the render arrays that have been getting created from the outermost to the innermost um, element on your page, um, they get gathered up into one massive render array and this HTML renderer gets called and it converts essentially from a PHP array to HTML. So at this stage, it converts from an array to HTML. That gets passed back uh, becomes the page response and the browser outputs it. So there are render arrays everywhere. There are um, tiny render arrays for a button, for text. Um, there's render arrays for whole tables, for the outermost page, and they tend to be nested um, beneath each other. So they all get combined into you know, the 
single render array to rule them all um, before it gets turned into HTML. So they're not getting turned into HTML all along the way. So as a developer, you might be creating your own smaller render array, or you might be altering one of the render arrays somewhere in the pipeline. The keys in the array, so there's a PHP array, the keys, they either start with a pound sign or they don't start with a pound sign. <laughs> um, the ones that do start with a pound sign, those have special meaning to Drupal. So those might be, um, basically Drupal sees a key that starts with a pound sign and it says, okay, let me look up what this means. If it does not start with a pound sign, Drupal says, oh, this is just for the silly humans to understand. So it doesn't worry about it. Um, you can make array keys that are like body, top, bottom, whatever. Drupal doesn't really care what you um, use as the name of your array keys as long as it doesn't start with a pound sign. So in a lot of, time, a lot of cases, if you're looking at a render array, you might see something like page, top, bottom, without a pound sign at the beginning. That is just for organization. That's just for legibility for the developer. If we encounter render arrays uh, infrequently, chances are we encountered them on a form. Forms are the, uh, programmatic forms at least, are the most common time where a developer essentially will be writing render arrays. Um, so this is just an example of an element, um, a render element. So you see all of these keys start with pound signs. That means they mean something to Drupal. Type text field. That tells Drupal what twig file should I use to render this thing. All of these other ones, these are variables in the twig file. These get passed to the twig file as variables. This title one, it does not start with a pound sign. So Drupal doesn't really care about it. That's just for us to understand and to group this render array in a way that we can comprehend it. This is an example, if you were to pause the rendering cycle of a Drupal page right before it turns into HTML, um, this is what it would look like. I think this is from the Umami uh, profile. So you can see there's page, page top, page bottom, and so on. All of the ones that don't start with pound signs, again, are just used for organization and for us to understand. But the ones that do start with pound sign, type HTML. That's, again, going to tell Drupal which twig file should I be looking at. So it's probably looking at HTML, oh, yes it is, HTML.HTML.twig. Um, there's some other properties like the cache property, which contains some caching information we will talk about. There's lots of render properties you're going to see um, frequently. The type one, like type text field, type HTML, that usually determines which twig file is used for rendering. There are a couple of others, markup, plain text. Um, you might see these commonly as well. And, we'll, and um, there's an API page dedicated to all of the types of render elements. So here's the markup render element. Um, this is how people usually get their feet wet with making render arrays. Um, you just say type markup and then you get to write HTML. Um, nothing too fancy there. If you use the plain text key, um, it will not um, treat the HTML you write as HTML. It'll actually just print it out to the end user. So the user will actually see the HTML tags. So if you have a comment section and you're rendering what people wrote in the comments, um, you could use the plain text to protect against um, attacks. So to protect against people writing HTML and trying to render it in your comment section um, and sort of hijacking the rest of your page. So if you render it as plain text, then um, any HTML they write in, your, in their comments won't work. It'll just display as plain text. Type uh, checkbox is another 
um, example, which just renders out a regular old input type equals checkbox. Um, so we do type equals checkbox. That determines which Twig file gets used to render this. Title and return value are variables which are used in that Twig file. So type checkbox, value, yes, I accept. So in this Twig file, they're taking return value as a variable and they're printing it out under the value property. I'm going to skip. There we go. I was close to caching. Okay. Um, okay. Lots to cover here, but um, caching at a high level, what is it, what can be cached, and how do we want to cache it? Um, so we talked about this massive render array composed of larger and smaller pieces um, of a puzzle, which ultimately build a page. Um, turning that massive render array into a page can take a lot of time. This is the same diagram we looked at earlier. Taking the entire render array and converting it to HTML is a resource intensive process. It can be slow. So instead of re-rendering the whole page every time someone loads it, why don't you only reload what changes? So once you load it once, remember what the HTML looked like and wait until the content changes before you do those computations again. That's essentially caching in a nutshell. When you're doing caching though, it's not, so, it's not as easy as just saying when it changes, um, update it. You have a couple of questions. What are we caching? When does it change? How do we cache it? Where does the cache get saved? In Drupal 8, um, cache tags were introduced. And this really does sometimes let you take that attitude of uh, when it gets updated, let it be up, let it refresh automatically. If you use cache tags um, properly, you can have that sort of um, it magically refreshes the cache scenario. So when you're setting up the caching on your render arrays, so to be clear, you specify the caching properties for each render array. You do so um, using cache tags, cache context, and cache max age. There are other options, but these are the ones you'll commonly use. So cache tags um, are essentially categories assigned to individual elements. So you can say, this one has a cache tag of node five. When node five gets updated, this item will also need to be cleared and rebuilt. Um, cache contexts specify uh, when is this cache item, when does it need to be um, different. So when I visit a page, the user login block, which says welcome Ashraf, um, I can't cache that and share that cache with other users. I don't want it to also say welcome Ashraf to someone else. Um, so in that case, we have a different context for the cache. We can have one copy of the cache for me and one copy for every other user. Um, so in that case, we would do cache, caching per user. And there's also caching max age. How long is the cache item good for? Um, in some cases, you can say it's not cacheable. Cache max age is zero. In other cases, you might say it's cacheable for a year because we uh, we have cache tags which will clear it when it changes. Um, and in other cases, you might say it's, the cache is good for one minute. So if you have a lot of traffic and maybe it's a sports site, you want the results to be refreshed every minute, but during those minutes, you do want it to be cached. So in the render arrays, we set these cache properties under the cache key prefixed by a pound sign. This is what it looks like. We have our regular old markup in our render array, but then we have the cache property. We specify the tags, the context, and the max age. The tags are, in this example, node underscore list, which basically tells Drupal, this is a list of nodes. Anytime any node changes, re, re, uh, rebuild the cache for this item, clear the cache for this item. This list also contains node one. Anytime node one changes, rebuild the cache for this item. 
context user. Um, this cache should be unique per user. If I set no cache context, this cache will be shared across all users. You could do a context of user role, so the cache can be shared for each user role. If the page output is different per user role, that would be appropriate. Max age, you can put a time, I believe in seconds, or you can put this permanent constant, um, so it just won't get cleared um, based on time. Okay, I, I feel like I was sprinting during that presentation, um, <laughs> but I guess I got through it all. Um, and we have two or three minutes for questions. Again, this was taken from the three-month class, um, which is two three-hour classes a week. In that course, we, we would spend a full three hours on just Twig, where the first half is talking about Twig, the second half is hands-on exercises. Same with render arrays, same with caching. Um, so we, for what we covered today, I guess we would have spent nine, nine hours um, with hands-on exercises included. Um, but I hope going through it quickly was beneficial and gives you something to go on. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Um, and if anyone's interested in this course, which starts on Sunday, um, come talk with me and we can figure out if it is beneficial for you. Yes? In the example you gave right at the end about using contests, yes. just to make sure I understand, if I have a page where there's a user-specific a, a user block in the upper right that says hello, yeah. you know, hello person, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing on the page that's different. Great question. Through context and then everything else on the page, I can just cache using other things. Right, okay, great question. So this, this cacheability of render arrays, um, it bubbles up through throughout the page. So if there is a block that um, is specific to a user, but the rest of the whole page um, could be cached for everyone, what ends up happening is the other blocks on the page, they will still be cached for everyone. Your block, which has a cache context of user, will have a different cache item per user. There, but like I said, cache uh, bubbles up caching rules bubble up to the outermost page. So the outermost page, because it has one thing on the page that varies per user, the whole page will vary per user. So generally speaking, you want to avoid having a single block on a page that breaks, you could say breaks uh, cacheability across user accounts. Um, and that is something that, that you start to, to optimize for because Outside of Drupal, you, you might have Varnish as a caching layer. Outside of that, you might have um, a, a CDN as another caching layer. And they typically will only cache entire pages. So if you are making these pages um, have a unique cache item per user, then Varnish and the CDN are basically saying, we can't, cache, we, we can't share cache across users. And in that case, you're forcing um, a hit to a Drupal um, so that it can rebuild a different version of the page for each user. Did I answer it? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, it's 3.45. All right, thank you all. I hope this was useful.